Um, my name is Petra Slinkard. Uh, most of you I know, but for those of you that I don't know, uh, I have the pleasure of serving as PEMS Director of Curatorial Affairs and the Nancy B. Putnam Curator of Fashion and Textiles. Um, and before we get started, I just want to offer you a couple of reminders. One is that we have the opportunity to open, maybe, it's not going, ah, there we go, uh, our Guanda exhibition which just opened uh, in early April. I don't know why that isn't working. Corey, can you help me? Thank you. Uh, so Gu and Da United Nations just opened in the museum's garden atrium in early April. Uh, and if you haven't yet had the opportunity to experience this exhibition, I welcome you to do so. It is absolutely a, a visceral um, delight and um, one that I think speaks to many of the topics and themes uh, that are current in our world today, and that is of unity uh, and thinking about individuality within unity. Uh, and then two exhibitions that are closing soon, we'll see if that works, uh, is Zachary Logan Remembrance, which is currently on view in the Timmer Meditation Gallery. This closes May 7th. Um, it is an intimate and yet very powerful show uh, that speaks again to some interesting topics that pertain to death, mourning, and remembrance. Um, and then also in our Dodge Special Exhibition Gallery, we have Spirits, the work of Serene Sherpa and Robert Beer, which is on view through um, May 29th. Uh, this is an exhibition that I think has really delighted and surprised many individuals, um, but it also speaks to the um, ideas around what it means to transplant yourself from one uh, country to another, from one culture to another, from one time period to another. Um, so thank you again for joining. And without further ado, I have the pleasure uh, to host you all this afternoon um, in our combined Director's Dialogue and PEM Reads Engagement. So thank you all for joining us in person and thank you all for those of you who are joining us from home. Um, our Director's Dialogue series and PEM program are wonderful examples of how the museum brings the PEM community together, both locally and globally, uh, around the exchange of ideas and how we share our unique perspectives with each other. Um, for those of you who do participate, our next PEM Reads program will take place on June 6th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, Joycelyn Snell, uh, a PEM guide and a board advise mem advisor member will be facilitating. Um, and the book that we are discussing is an exciting one entitled The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. The Personal Librarian is a fictionalized telling of the life work of Bella de Costa Green, who was the personal librarian of J.P. Morgan, as well as the first director of the Morgan Library and Museum. And so everyone attending today will receive an invita invitation to join that event soon. Um, and so now it's my distinct pleasure to tell you a little bit more about our featured guest, uh, Oleksandra Kovalchuk. Um, she is the Deputy Director of Development uh, at the Odessa Fine Arts Museum in Odessa, Ukraine. She is an advocate for our field and also a leader um, of the NGO Museum of Change. And she is, in addition, an acting member of the Odessa City Council, as well as an activist and a volunteer. The Museum of Change is a non-governmental organization founded by Alexandra, and it is one that is partnering with UNESCO and the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, or ALIPH, um, which is the only global fund exclusively dedicated to the protection and rehabilitation of cultural heritage in conflict zones and post-conflict situations. Since the invasion of Ukraine, Alexandra has been dedicated to helping Ukrainian museums preserve their art and cultural artifacts. Um, after the beginning of a full-scale military invasion, Alexandra took refuge in Salem with her husband and son in early 2022. Since then, Alexandra has been raising awareness about Ukrainian culture and the efforts of Ukrainian museums within the United States by sharing their stories as well as her own. 
She is engaged with institutions locally, such as the House of Seven Gables and the MFA Boston, as well as national institutions, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, we appreciate you being with us today, and joining Oleksandra Kowalczyk is, of course, uh, Linda Roscoe Hargan, the Marie, Rosemary and Ike Van Otterloo, um, Director and CEO of the Peabody Essex Museum. I'm going to turn it over to you, Linda, and I will join you all later to help facilitate questions. Thank you. Thank you, Petra, and good afternoon, Alexandra. I have been waiting for this moment, and I want to welcome everyone here in person as, as well as all of you who are Zooming. And for our Zoom guests, I just want to remind you that for the Q&A session, you can go into the Zoom and use the chat and, and register your, your questions. So as Alexandra and I are talking, and I'm gonna hope there's rotating slides behind me, um, what you're going to be seeing is a selection that Alexandra has made for us today. And so you'll be seeing images of the Odessa Museum of Fine Arts before uh, the invasion, the museum during the early times of the invasion, the Odessa Museum finding new ways of functioning during the war, which is um, a miracle in and of itself in terms of continuing to function. And then uh, because Sadly, um, many of us really do not know um, very much of anything about um, Ukrainian artists' contribution to their national art history and to um, international art history. Um, Alexandra has included images <clears throat> of Ukrainian art since the 11th century, as well as contemporary Ukrainian art made during the war. So that's the visual feast that will be rotating um, behind us. So um, let's get personal uh, initially, and I I'd love to know what prompted you to become a museum professional. Um, hello. First of all, <laughs> hello to everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here, for giving a voice to Ukrainian art and Ukrainian cultural community that uh, I'm also trying to represent. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting and philosophic question. I actually wanted to be uh, involved in art world uh, and to become an art historian when I was a teenager. But at that time, um, it wasn't clear uh, that it was actually it was clear that people working in museums wouldn't be very um, successful economically in life. So I've started a different career, which actually helped me to go to the museum to drop the career in um, business and to become a deputy director and then director of the Odessa Fine Arts Museum. So life brought me back to the museum uh, in a different way, but I think that uh, I've managed to gain uh, some skills that were very important to local community to help uh, uh, them see the museum, which was very important in the moment. So uh, many of us, I'm sure, have never had the opportunity to visit the Odessa Museum. So it would be um, helpful if you could tell us a bit about its its history and its um, mission and um, and what the nature of its collection is. So the museum was opened uh, 1899. It's about 123 years old. Uh, it's, um, it was uh, opened as an initiative of local community. A lot of people, um, it's a, like, actually like in the United States, a very similar model. Uh, people came together, they wanted to open the museum to promote arts for a local community, and uh, they fundraised, they've opened the museum, and then they've donated their own collections, or they were pitching in to buy something for the collection of the museum. And it existed like this until 1917, when um, revolution started in Russian Empire, and uh, very soon after that, uh, Ukraine proclaimed its independence. And then for the next couple of years, there has been constant wars uh, and change of power between Red Army, White Army, like Army of Communists, Army of Russian Empire, 
and the Ukrainian army and other bandits that would work during such chaotic times. So the uh, museum reopened under communist power and uh, unfortunately um, part of the collection that museum has was, uh, uh, as we have a large part of our collection that was received before 1917, uh, but some part of the collection became um, a part of nationalization process. Actually, I personally call it a robbery that communists did towards private uh, uh, collections. They would go through private housings uh, of different people in Odessa and around Russian, former Russian empire. Uh, and they would collect art and uh, money, anything. There was, as you may know, Institute of Private Property was uh, just ceased to exist after, under the communist power. So part of the collection of the museum was works of art that mm. were stolen from their owners. And uh, um, I still think that, uh, and we, we speak about that constantly in our um, uh, exposition, that's something we feel necessary to acknowledge. Uh, but then uh, a large part of the collection was gained during the Soviet Union from different artists. And of course, in the last 30 years, it was um, a, a different next process for the collection when we would gain things that Soviet Union wouldn't let the museum to have. All of the forbidden artists, all of the artists that were crossed out the art history, uh, like Ukrainian avant-garde, for example, which was nearly destroyed in the end of the 30s. Um, and we have about 10,000 objects. It's uh, uh, paintings, uh, sculpture, graphic works from um, 17th uh, century to present day. And we have a very good collection of contemporary Ukrainian art. And we keep collecting that we're trying to collect war, uh, wartime art. Uh, however, it's very challenging because we are limited in funds, obviously, especially during the war. Mm -hmm. So is part of the existing collection works that you would still describe as having been stolen from someone I mean, the repatriation issue in the international art community uh, and the museum community is quite large. So is, has there been any discussion about trying to return? We works? constantly we constantly speak about that. But um, first, uh, for this particular period of time in Soviet Union, when it was very early Soviet Union, um, it's uh, it's extremely hard by now to find uh, the uh, ancestors of that people, um, and uh, we constantly speak about legislation. At the moment, Ukrainian legislation wouldn't allow uh, this to happen, and there is a specifics in Ukraine. All of the art that is uh, in Ukrainian public museums belongs to the state. So we kind of operate the collection, but collection actually belongs to the state. But we keep uh, having these discussions, and uh, um, personally, I think that we will get towards this after this war, because mm -hmm. this war again highlights all of these questions of um, human rights, of uh, uh, private properties, of uh, protection of human and everything that is uh, connected around our life, including property, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's a long journey and, and many museums around the world have taken a long time to deal with the, the stolen property during the Nazi era. So, you know, it's a long trajectory period, but it's good that the conversation is happening for sure. And uh, actually for our museum, we've lost uh, a large amount of our collection after the occupation uh, by, Ro uh, by Romanian and uh, German uh, arm um, armies. Mm -hmm. And um, about a third of the collection was stolen and uh, we still don't even don't even know where it is. Maybe it will occur somewhere, some one day. Mm -hmm. So Petra mentioned uh, as part of the introduction that 
you and your family moved here um, shortly after the, the full-scale invasion happened. And that, that had to have been an incredibly hard uh, decision to, to make. Uh, when you and Patron and I had lunch, you talked about how you tried to get the museum ready before you left. So could you tell us something about that? And then, and then really, you know, what was the underlying motivation for you feeling like you had to leave? Uh, that's, um, um, that, that period of life is one of the hardest in my life. And um, I remember uh, months before invasion when every day we would think about will war happen or will it not happen? And it's been extremely hard for all the Ukrainian communities. And um, we, of course, we were hoping for best, but preparing for worse. And as uh, you could see here, some pictures from the museum yard when we would have fundraising events, something that here you're very familiar with. And um, we had a very nice and established circle of donors around the museum and the people who supported the museum. So we had funds that we could invest uh, into packaging materials, into increasing the security measures of the museum. So we were trying to get ready. While my deputies at the museum uh, knew that uh, in case of invasion, we will be trying to leave. As you could see from news, um, things were very brutal in occupied areas, especially for people who would represent uh, the you know, very strong uh, Ukrainian voices uh, in these territories, in these cities, and that uh, these people would be targeted and often murdered or uh, stolen or tortured, etc. And as I was also and still am a member of, um, of the party uh, of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the, the president of Ukraine, uh, it's called uh, People's Servant. So as I'm, I was elected from this party to the Odessa City Council, uh, I knew that uh, I I personally, I would be targeted. And my baby was at that time only uh, half, only a year and a half, a little bit uh, even less, 15 months. And uh, it was extremely uh, hard for me to think of um, being arrested and uh, uh, maybe killed and uh, thinking about what will happen to him. And this is the situation that we could later see in some occupied territories of Kiev region when whole family mm -hmm. of uh, uh, members of city council from, um, from very strong Ukrainian uh, parties uh, were murdered and executed. And that is why uh, I've decided to leave as soon as it will start. Of course, uh, right now we are uh, hoping to return um, as soon as it will be safe for for our baby, and that's uh, that's why we're staying here. But uh, we we're hoping to return home as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And I hope that return happens as as soon as possible, because obviously then that would mean the war has ended, hopefully successfully for the Ukraine. And uh, perhaps um, it, it may be a bit personal, so you can deflect it if you'd like, but I'm sure people would like to know, you know, why did you relocate to the Salem area? My parents lived here for about uh, uh, 13 years, and uh, um, they were obviously happy to host us when it all started. However, we've been trying to stay in Europe for some time and came here only in three weeks after it started. We've, we had a hope that it will be over very soon. Somehow mm -hmm. we had this illusion that right now all the world will stand on our side and Russia will have to uh, pull back its forces. But as we can see, uh, it still hasn't happened. Uh, but I really hope that it will happen soon. And it's not only hope, we do whatever we can every day. Well, I have to say that the, that the, it's not just the spirit or resilience, but really the courage of the Ukrainian people uh, 
in terms of resistance and and defending the country and the culture and its people is really quite remarkable. It, it, it's just quite something. So um, obviously you're here at a distance and there are a variety of, of activities that you've been involved in. So could you describe how from a distance um, you've been able to work with preservation efforts and um, reconstruction efforts and that sort of thing? Um, of course, uh, it was challenging to be disconnected from um, from my colleagues, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I had a luxury of uh, being in a distance uh, from what was happening there, which gave me a little bit more strength to work every day to be able to continue when during the misswings that were happening all over Ukraine. And um, even this anger gave me more, more strength to do that. So I was constantly in touch with all of these international organizations. I was able to uh, work uh, um, consistently uh, and to and I was online all the time because there was no uh, power issues here like in Ukraine you could stay without power for a couple of days uh, especially during this winter during the attacks on infrastructure so this gave me a little bit of a bonus of being online of being um, of having more strength uh, to to advocate for Ukrainian museums and uh, also Ukrainian museums are very diverse and for some uh, some teams it was challenging to talk with international donors there was even sometimes it could be a language barrier sometimes it could be just um, you know like a stillness when you uh, you cannot act you need someone to help you to act when you are in a deep um, a trauma process so that's where we supported our colleagues we helped them to put together the budget they we would file the budget and we would help them to receive funds to find things and on early stage of uh, invasion it was very hard and not uh, all the businesses were working and uh, it was hard to find certain things right now it's much easier than it was then so um I was uh, doing all of this work um, for my colleagues and uh, in touch with them, COVID, COVID actually gave us a heads up uh, mm -hmm. on giving us this uh, um, skill of working long distance of online meetings, online, uh, um, online everything. Uh, so who, who, could, uh, who could think that it would come handy, this COVID experience? So was this um, all in the context of um, the Museum for Change that you were one of the co-founders of in 2017, or was also some of this individual and, and personal um, connection? Because I, I think it's useful to understand what the Museum for Change is, what its mission was when it was established, and, and what it's doing now. Uh, we've established it before uh, I started working in the museum. And it was its idea was to build this uh, bridge between museums, which were at that time uh, very old fashioned post Soviet uh, model and the uh, local community to use best benchmark uh, practices that we would see in United States or in other countries of the world and to use this experience uh, to to build community around the museum to communicate, etc, managing skills. And of course, as soon as the uh, invasion started, uh, we felt like uh, we have to help our colleagues. So the mission of this organization was changed uh, briefly, and uh, we just started uh, helping our colleagues. And I hope that this service will no longer be needed as soon as war is over but um it it was also also the museum was still in a way working and uh, we had funding can still have funding problems so i did a lot of uh, um, lectures here and speeches where i would fundraise 
to support my colleagues in the museum, to give them some bonuses to the salary that government was paying, which is actually nothing. So that was also part of the job that had to be done. So what is the status of the Odessa Museum now? Is it, is it open? Is it functioning? Yeah, we have reopened in uh, end of June. And since that, uh, we keep opening spaces. You know, like uh, we all have this problem of uh, exhibition space. Mm -hmm. And we always have a lot of curatorial projects and different, different uh, interesting suggestions. And, uh, um, and we always struggle with the space. So uh, now we don't have problem of the space. We have other problems. <laughs> unfortunately but not with space so it's about um defining your um no matter how bad situation is you can always turn uh, turn it into an asset so we are using now our empty halls of the museums empty rooms where art is no longer presented we use it for temporary exhibitions and uh, right now we have a cycle of uh, exhibitions which is called languages of war where different ukrainian artists uh, uh, show their wartime works and it's a very interesting um, experience for uh, our community to try to reflect on what is going on together with artists in different ways and uh, we have uh, about 60 percent of the museum already functioning open with all of this contemporary ukrainian art and we have a very interesting list of exhibitions till the end of the year so whole museum all all of the rooms where we used to have 17th century to contemporary art now would be about contemporary Ukrainian art. So the works that ha from the collection are now safely in storage somewhere? I wouldn't use word safely. Fair enough. For that, uh, there is no safe, uh, uh, safe space in Ukraine right now, as long as the Russian missiles can hit anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, in the end of this presentation, actually, there is a work by Aleftina Kahidze, um, and she says that uh, I'm alive in Ukraine, but that's just a coincidence, or, or it's just by chance. So uh, when Ukrainian art and Ukrainian museums are uh, not destroyed, it's just uh, by chance. It can be destroyed any moment. And uh, part of our actions, of course, in the museum, and that's what we help our colleagues with, is digitalization, because that's something that uh, assures that at least if objects are destroyed, we will know something about that object. Mm -hmm. So there was an article uh, in one of the art newspapers um, recently about the, the efforts of the international organizations, um, UNESCO, and also the World Monuments Fund, and. Um, obviously, a leaf, if I can say A L I P H, uh, and so the 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 extent of the damage is 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 really quite astounding. Some of it's collateral damage, as in just the effects of war by by being where it, uh, the the museums are located. But there is also d evidence of the cultural heritage sites and and objects actually being targeted. Um, by the Russians because they represent Ukrainian history and um, heritage. And um, there are astounding um, statements that have been uh, proven in terms of you know, the art theft that's going on is on a scale not seen in Europe since World War II. Um, that their um, UNESCO has estimated there are at least 241 cultural heritage sites that have been damaged, uh, that includes, uh, or destroyed, uh, that includes 18 museums and something like 12 um, libraries. And yet um, within Ukraine, the statistics seem to suggest that that really is well beyond the figure of 500. And now Odessa has been added by UNESCO to its list of threatened uh, world heritage sites. I think one of the astounding things that came out in this article was that um, UNESCO has 
predicted that um, in order to support recovery and reconstruction, that um, it's going to be necessary to invest $6.9 billion um, towards that over time. And uh, that's just an astounding kind of figure. So, um, you know, that certainly left me wondering where that funding is going to come from. So how have have you already seen in the museum community the, the kind of funding that would suggest that 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 kind of goal could actually be reached? I mean, UNESCO does not have six point nine billion dollars sitting in its bank account, as far as I know. Uh, well, I think that there are um, always uh, different uh, and, and you're familiar with that uh, as a museum director that there are different sources of uh, uh, funding for such a project. It can be always private donors. It can be always uh, um, global programs that are happening that we've never participated because we couldn't, for example, some some pro programs of European Union that we can now file when the war will be over. Um, and uh, I also uh, rely in the everything linked to rebuilding. I also rely to Ukrainian communities, uh, even though business is struggling right now, obviously, because businesses and productions are also targeted by Russians. They want to destroy everything that gives uh, uh, Ukrainian e and the economics in the first place. Uh, and I'm sure that when Ukrainian businesses are in better shape, uh, they would also um, be considering supporting uh, rebuilding of cultural heritage sites. And also because cultural heritage sites is an important tool of economics. It's also something that can help our cities, especially smaller cities, uh, uh, smaller towns, to um, to be more visited by tourists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I'm very optimistic about that uh, about that time. And uh, even uh, UNESCO, they have their own projects, but Ukraine was never part of that um, activity, and it will be now. Well, I mean, it was an astounding announcement when the when the director general um, of UNESCO did come to Ukraine in order to begin to estimate what kind of support was going to be needed over the next um, 10 years. So let's switch gears um, a, a bit and um, Ukraine, the Ukrainian history of art is long and distinguished, and obviously there are slides of works um, behind us, but how would you characterize some of the, the principal accomplishments of Ukrainian art? And I think more to the point also would be the fact that there's been confusion between what is Ukrainian art, what is Russian art, that sort of thing. Uh, we have to remember that Ukrainian territory um, was uh, um, colonized uh, by Russian Empire. Then it was part of Soviet Union, which was also an imperial uh, state. And uh, we see that, um, in a way, Russian Empire, Soviet Union coexists at the same time in Russian Federation, in the modern Russian Federation. So it's like a hydra with all of this. Um, all of these uh, uh, states <laughs> from the past that still exist. And uh, that is why, for example, when Austro-Hungarian Empire stopped existing, it was uh, uh, after all of these years, after 100 years, it was easy to distinguish uh, um, Austrian art or you know that uh, Klimt is uh, Austrian artist, or you know that uh, Mucha is Czech as artist, uh, and you don't have a confusion. You know that uh, Vispiansky is uh, a Polish artist. It's easy to uh, to know all of them. But in our case, it never this empire changed the name, but never stopped existing. And its empire continued uh, feeding on the best, uh, um, the best talents of all of its countries, not only Ukraine, it was uh, Georgia, it was uh, um, Kazakhstan, it was uh, Belarus, uh, which unfortunately uh, becoming part of Russian 
federation as in our eyes right now. So they were absorbing all of the talents and the saying that they are Russian and being always uh, associated with Russia. Uh, and Ukrainian uh, association with Ukrainian was always something bad. Um, and even uh, for Soviet Union, everybody knew that collaborators, Nazi collaborators were Ukrainians, but Russians were the best, the best, uh, uh, the best nation, the most loyal one, the strongest one, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, the higher moral, moral values nation, which was all we can see, it was all the myth and the lie. Uh, that is why even during this time, it is still so hard to um, to explain who we are and that many artists were stolen by Russia. Uh, who actually were Ukrainians. And uh, another thing is in the way in the United States labels are uh, for mm -hmm. Ukrainian art. Uh, even though during this year we continue these conversations with the different museums, it's so hard to, um, to make them understand that you shouldn't uh, write Russian Empire next to works of art from artists uh, or Ukrainian artists, and you wouldn't see that someone uh, writes Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire when there when there is a label to artists uh, from uh, Poland, Czech, uh, uh, Czechs, etc. Or it's very hard to find in the United States some artists that would be um, American, uh, born uh, let's say Boston. British Empire, former mm -hmm. British Empire. That is something I've never seen, never seen. But somehow everybody consider it the right thing, the right academical way of thinking that if you say born in Kiev and then you add Russian Empire at that time, now Ukraine, Russian Empire, that is correct and academic. But if you're saying that this artist was born in Boston, you do not need to add British Empire to that. So this is a double standard. And another nice example for that would be if we're referring to an artist who was born in Germany, somewhere in the end of 30s, should you write Third Reich? Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen that. <laughs> I've never seen that. But again, for Russian Empire, that is something that is considered acceptable. And we continue all of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And if uh, to distinguish what is the main uh, input of Ukrainian art, Ukrainian art was always a uh, resilience uh, art. It was an uh, art of fight. It was always uh, the, far, the art of um, standing uh, into the oppression and fighting for your rights and fight fighting for your identity. It was a revolutionary art in a way. And uh, that's something that occurred all the time. And in the history of Ukrainian art, you can see that uh, there was high point, then everybody were repressed, killed, or almost nearly extinguished. Then again, it was a high point, And then again, nearly nearly a full uh, oppression of the artists. And so it continued until what is going on right now when many Ukrainian artists are in Ukrainian militaries, are standing in the front lines, and some are getting killed. Um, and we see those, uh, and we were every other day, we see the necrologues and uh, uh, Ukrainian contemporary Ukrainian artists uh, are again struggling from the same uh, entity from Russia. So it is fascinating to hear you align the character of Ukrainian art with revolution and resistance. So um, obviously there'll, there'll be some images on the screen of contemporary Ukrainian art, but could you tell us more in the sense of our Ukrainian artists now, because there's this long history throughout the world of artists making art in reaction to to describe or to comment on the state of war are, are are ukrainian artists doing things like videos or are they painting are they making prints 
Um, I know there have been several stamps that have been issued. So is, is there a principal way in which you, contemporary C Ukrainian artists are, are creating their, their art? I think it depends on the medium the artist is using. Uh, they usually continue working in their, um, in their field that they used. Um, and they react in different ways. There are some artists who were just speechless and frozen, and for a very long time they've described it as they are incapable to create art because they cannot uh, absorb all of this violence and grief and anger and uh, pain that is constantly happening. So some artists cannot continue working during the war. But some artists find their strength in that, actually, and uh, that is something that, on contrary, gives them strength to continue being um, alive and feeling alive, uh, reflecting on things that are happening. And if we look at the art history, that is also something that is not so often represented in museum collections. But uh, for every uh, war, uh, the most uh, thing that we all know about is Guernica, mm -hmm. uh, for example, something that uh, when we see all of this destruction, when we see all of these uh, deaths, um, artists as part of our communities are those who can absorb this and um, reflect on, on these uh, actions. And it's actually part of documentation of war. And that is something that will stay in our museums and collections for hundreds of years to represent uh, this war, to speak about it, to give uh, new generations memory uh, of how it was mm -hmm. and why and what, how we should act to avoid these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move us toward um, the end of our, our conversation. And, and ask you what sustains you and gives you hope? Um, it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's my people, uh, it's Ukrainians, uh, it's this uh, incredible stories that inspire me. Um, I see especially from museums leadership, people uh, from my colleagues who are doing amazing, incredible things, uh, who are um, create, who are making an impossible things during the war, uh, that makes me very proud and gives me a lot of strength uh, to continue this work. And um, also, it's just action of uh, any people. Uh, I think that it's very important uh, not only to. Uh, look at Ukrainian resilience, uh, but to uh, think of what we can do to avoid, uh, even not to avoid, for a better future uh, for, uh, for any community. And uh, this war is uh, happening here already. It's uh, Russian influence, Chinese influence towards local communities of Americans, towards supporting the um, the, the disinf disinformation, uh, inner conflict uh, between different uh, views and uh, different communities. I think that uh, um, it's very, it's, it's a very important moment to think about how do we all act to make sure that uh, our, in our future we are safe and our children are safe and free. And one last question, and that is, you know, how can individuals um, outside of the Ukraine uh, provide some help? Uh, there are, well, <laughs> I don't know if I can ask to, um, uh, to uh, keep supporting, uh, providing military uh, help to Ukraine. I think that is something that actually helps uh, preserve Ukrainian art in the best way. The thing that uh, for sure will help us to uh, preserve art is uh, heavy weapons uh, uh, that our army could use to stop the Russian army. This barbarian actually a force that is trying to destroy most of the Ukraine and they aim to conquer all Ukraine 
but also um, I can uh, always uh, suggest uh, uh, different international organizations such as uh, World uh, um, Kitchen, World, um, um, they, uh, they provide a lot of support to all of the uh, territories in Ukraine, but not Red Cross. Because the Red Cross uh, is uh, doing a lot of uh, questionable things. Uh, they're not helping with, with Ukrainian prisoners of war. They've opened a new office in Russia recently for a lot of money. So this organization is highly questionable. Uh, so I'm calling to support Razum for Ukraine, other Ukrainian foundations that are here in the United States. In North Shore, it's Dabro New England. Uh, it's Sunflower of Peace in Boston. Uh, these uh, uh, foundations help militaries and civilians. And if you want to have specific to help specifically museums, you can always donate Museum for Change. You can always donate uh, other Ukrainian NGOs that are providing help to Ukrainian uh, specialists, like Ukraine um, Crisis Center for Arts or MOCA NGO. Uh, I could always provide a list of links <laughs> that could be sent uh, to people who would be interested. All right. Well, um, Alexandra, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of the work that you're doing. I want to wish you every ounce of continued resilience and, and hope. Uh, and I think um, if you're open to it, I'd like to turn it over to, to Petra to take some questions from the audience, including Thank anyone you. on Zoom. Thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, Linda. Um, I'm going to kick it off with a Zoom question that is, um, is the Holy Sophia Cathedral still standing? Uh, yes, yes, that's the um, oldest uh, um, church of Ukraine, uh, not church cathedral. Yes, it's uh, dated by 11th century and it has beautiful actually mosaics in the beginning of this, somewhere not in the middle of this presentation. Uh, you would see the orant. Um, it is still standing. I'm hoping that it will stand for many, many centuries more. Uh, there was a, uh, but unlike other cathedrals that were destroyed by Soviet Union um, in the 30s and later on. Um, so this, they have a nice museum, they have a beautiful territory, and they have a research center. So it's, uh, a, I hope that you will get to visit Ukraine one day, and uh, you should uh, go there. Um, that should be a must-see place for you. Thank you. And a follow up question to that, um, which you may have already alluded to is, but do you have a considerable number of works of art from Holy Sophia and other religious buildings? Um, the number of works that are stored there? Oh, do you, does the Odessa Museum have oh, examples uh, of religious work? Well, we have some uh, religious art in our collection, um, mostly received to the museum collection in 90s. Uh, and end of uh, 80s. Um, and um, we, yeah, we have a lot, it's a, it's a topic for a whole, I could give a whole lecture on uh, the um, stories of religious art. It wasn't easy to preserve this art because in Soviet Union, religion was forbidden. The only religion was Lenin and Stalin and communist leaders. So there they were gods and uh, obviously though the previous gods were supposed to be destroyed and uh, not everything survived. For example, we had 4,000 iconostasis, huge iconostasis. Um, of uh, 16th, 17th century. Right now we have uh, four, mm. four full iconostasis. So uh, sometimes they were uh, musified, they were mm, relocated to museums, but some are still stored in uh, some cathedrals in Ukraine. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience?
Yes, of course. Uh, uh, in most of Ukrainian cities that are not located on the front lines, um, life goes on, uh, city councils are working, everything is working, businesses are, are working, restaurants are open. People continue living their life, but they have to adjust to mislink, um, to uh, other, to drones that can arrive to the city. So there are a lot of threats, uh, but people try to continue living, to continue moving our economy forward. And um, and I continue doing my part, analyzing things that are going on uh, in the city council, and I'm going actually to visit Ukraine next week uh, for the city council meeting in particular. Um, hello, thank you so much for this presentation and your activism. Um, in the US and in many countries, the, the National Park Service plays a role in cultural preservation. Um, and I'm curious if that's the case. I know the Ukrainian national parks are extensive and I was curious if there was that intersection of natural and cultural uh, preservation in terms of the role that the national parks play. And the other question I had was, I was curious if the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience has played a role yet, or if you're connected to that network, uh, a global network of extraordinary places that have lots of strategies around fundraising and, and supports uh, in different ways. And I was curious if Ukraine was part of that network. Uh, I've never heard about this uh, organization, actually. I will Google it. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Ukraine has a lot of uh, museum uh, and reservations kind of uh, zones uh, where uh, it would be a lot of uh, natural museums and um, preservation zones uh, like um, uh, recreational zones that are <clears throat> there's a lot of that um, and uh, unfortunately what we also see right now that even in that zones widespread things are happening right now, for example, in Escania Nova, uh, Russian army stays there and they're just hunting all of this, um, all of these animals uh, who were preserved there and they are just having fun uh, killing them. And uh, that is what is happening all over um, occupied uh, territories. Um, but uh, yes, of course, uh, we have uh, a lot of such zones in Ukraine and we have, uh, as you can see, the country is very big, actually. It's the biggest country in Europe and, uh, and obviously we have a huge uh, natural um, capacities and uh, um, it's very beautiful places. Again, I hope that you will be able to visit one day. We have another question from uh, a Zoom attendee. It is, did you bring any art to the US to protect it? And if so, will it then be returned to Ukraine? Uh, yet for now, uh, yet for not, for now, uh, ex uh, the art from Ukraine that is present uh, abroad is uh, usually part of exhibitions that are happening. There are more in Europe, unfortunately, in the United States. Uh, you can see a bit less because it's um, more expensive to uh, bring art here. Uh, but I hope that this will change and that we will have some, we will see some comprehensive uh, ex exhibitions that would speak about history of Ukrainian art. Uh, but of course, uh, I wouldn't take uh, anything from the museum in my pocket to bring it here. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Hello, what a pleasure to have this surprise, to have the opportunity to hear you. Um, I am of Ukrainian heritage, and I am uh, the cultural chair of the Ukrainian Women's League of America, which is 100 almost years old. One of our priorities is always to sustain Ukrainian culture and to uh, preserve it, to help, and so forth. And it has a be been a very difficult time for us at this time 
to see what is happening to the Ukrainian heritage. One of the projects that we're going to be taking up now is the decolonization of Ukrainian uh, Russified art. And you spoke of that uh, uh, briefly. The emphasis on uh, teaching the American public that a lot of the Ukrainian artists are not really Russian artists has been a very difficult process. I know myself through the years when I have gone to various museums and had that issue. So I guess my question is, how are you working on this particular very painful subject? Oh. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I'm trying to contact uh, direct to the museums and asking them to um, change uh, uh, titles. But of course, uh, usually museums have uh, larger collections and you need to work not only with things in exposition, but also with everything else. And uh, right now, actually, it is much easier than it was before February 24th. And we're grateful for that. And some museums are even deliberately hiring Ukrainian um, researchers and curators to work with their collection to um, to create bases and uh, to change these titles in inner documentation even. So uh, that is happening. Of course, it's um, and uh, there are also the colonizational studies that are happening right now and a lot of uh, different initiatives about that. Uh, Miroslava Mudrak from Ohio University, for example, speaks about that a lot. So I hope that it will change over the next couple of years. It's changing a little bit. The loudest uh, case was Metropolitan Museum that changed titles for Queen G and changed the title for the gas uh, Ukrainian dancers from Russian dan dancers, etc. It is happening. And after Metropolitan's Act, I think that more museums will follow as a natural thing. Well, and not surprisingly, I was curious about our own collection. So um, we have about 100 works in the collection that we actually need to research. They are primarily objects of craft and industrial art. Um, Alexandra has very kindly you know, taken a, an initial look at the list and has offered to connect us with people who can do the kind of research that, that we would need to do. Well, thank you. Alexandra, and thank you, Linda, and thank you all for being here with us today, both in person and online. We look forward to continuing the Director's Dialogue series uh, with you, as well as the PEM Read series. So please do look to PEM for more information on those programs soon. And again, Alexandra, thank you. I know that your family's here with you, and we appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.